Okay, we're here at Intel uh, Forecast 2012. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, and this is a CUBE conversation with Jason Waxman, who's the general manager, uh, Cloud Infrastructure Group at Intel. Welcome to CUBE Conversations. Thanks, Had a nice dinner last night with your yeah, team. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, I'm, al I'm always impressed with Intel. Um, just overall having uh, their nose in the right place at the right time early, and then the investment into R&D, and then coming into the markets and, and doing that. You guys certainly had had paid off for the company with the cloud investment years ago. You guys had made as a company, and it's uh, been well documented in, in, in the news of, of late. But I want to talk to you about um, cloud infrastructure. So um, let's first talk a little about your role at Intel. Um, sure. Intel's changing, obviously, always growing. The market's changing around computing. You've got storage and flash growing like crazy, enabling you know, cores on SSD cards, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Fusion I.O. or violin memory systems, all kinds of cool new things. Um, storage has been very successful, and you get the cloud group or the data center. They're all kind of coming together. So talk about the, the converged infrastructure equation right now inside Intel and how that relates to the marketplace. Yeah, so and I think, you know, so let me start with the customer for a second. You know, what the customer's okay. looking to do for a cloud is they really want to be able to take pools of compute network and storage and then be able to apply it to an application. And that fundamentally, from what I think about a cloud, and even before we started calling it cloud, we used to call it resource pools, and that's what it was about. And so what we're thinking about, and, and at the end of the day, we're not going to go sell a solution. We're an ingredient, we're a technology uh, company. But we're always thinking about what are the underlying technologies? What do we have to bring the market that's going to help be a game changer that allow people to innovate and deliver solutions based off of it? And so, you know, when I look at compute, one of the big things that we're looking at right now is not just how do we keep driving more cores and make it more power efficient within the Xeon product line, but how do we come up with interesting compute that addresses a range of different needs. And so as an example, we are, uh, you know, coming up on introducing some of our, our mic based products, which is the many integrated core, and this is for HPC types of applications, so companies that have very big analytic types of problems can leverage IA compatibility, but bring it to something that's got 50 cores or more. Um, we also are looking at introducing our first atom best based SOC, so on the opposite side of the spectrum, you've got these ultra lightweight, many you know, uh, scaled out types of servers and also looking at how you can put application-specific enhancements into it. So one of the big trends we see right now is media acceleration in servers themselves. And we've got things and instructions and software development kits to go make that, that happen. On the storage front, it's a lot of cases, it's about scale-out storage. So what people are doing is they're just taking a server, they're adding drives to it, and the introduction of non-volatile memory, interesting game changer there. So instead of having to continue to scale out just to drive I.O., now you can introduce uh, solid-state drives based on Intel technology, drive that I.O., drive the number of servers down and get more performance, lower cost out of it. What's the biggest thing that you guys are enabling within the cloud? Obviously it's an ingredient, you know, Intel inside, you know, the famous, you know, inside the PC. Yeah. You know, really creating that hardened technology that grew that whole application revolution. So for cloud, what are the key enablers that you guys are providing in there? Is it for the, on the application side, is it more on your OEMs or both? Yeah, so I, I think that the, there's sort of three basic buckets that I would say are important. I think number one is security right now. People want to know that the underlying infrastructure that they're deploying the cloud on is secure, and they have the ability to audit those security requirements. So we're putting in fundamental technologies like our trusted execution technology to go make that happen. Second, it's all around performance. Um, as much as people say performance doesn't matter, it really does. Um, and you have to continue to drive Moore's Law, we got to dri drive you know, more performance per core, more cores, and then make the systems themselves more efficient and, and deliver more performance. And then the third element is about efficiency. Um, it's amazing how much cost goes into just the power consumption, and that doesn't really do anybody any good. And so we got to go make sure that the performance divided by the energy efficiency is sort of the equation that we're, we're driving. Those are the three probably most under, you know, important ingredients, if you will, that are enabling a cloud solution today. So you guys always operate the cadence of Moore's Law, and how does that apply to cloud in your mind? Not necessarily from Intel. So if you take the, you know, the Intel perspective of Moore's Law, you know, doubling every, what, six months was it, is it? Yeah, every, every, every 18 months. Every 18 months, yep. doubling. So now the cloud's sitting out there as a resource, and we're just talking with Capgemini, and it's, it's, the view is consistent, the, the dust hasn't settled, it's, things are still in the air, evolving. Where does that kind of Moore's Law mentality really need to be focused on right now in the cloud? Is it at the pass, is it infrastructure as a service? What areas of the stack, if you will, yeah, um, it needs the most work. It, it, you know, it, honestly, it's, it's it's all of them. So, so let's take infrastructure as a server for a second. If I could tell you that the cost of your infrastructure was going to be effectively cut in half because you can get twice as much performance every eighteen months 
that's a pretty compelling you know thing to go ahead and drive from a from an infrastructure as a service and your cost per VM. If you look at it on the on the flip side, software as a service, people that are developing software as a service on scale they're not doing it with three servers, they're doing it with thousands of servers. And so if we can find a way to get twice as much capability out of that, it's a huge difference. And I'll just give you like one, one anecdotal example. We worked with two very large cloud service providers to figure out how we could accelerate their time to deployment to be ready with our new technology. Deployment so in could, terms of data center or the ability to prove it in services? To, to be able to deploy, say, the latest technology in their server okay, infrastructure. Gotcha. So let's assume they're, they're, they're deploying thousands of servers every month. Yeah. If I can take the new technology and then accelerate it six months, over a two year period, across just those two service providers, we're saving $750 million, two companies. That's the value of that infrastructure. In That's the value or in CapEx. Wow. And actually, I didn't even, I didn't even calculate the OpEx on yeah, top so of that. Probably even more. Probably even more, yeah. Maybe you're pushing a billion dollars, right? But that's the type of volume economics. This is not, the people who are delivering cloud services, they're not the ones who are doing it to do onesie twosie. They're doing it on scale, and that's really the value and the importance of Moore's Law. It's delivering more capability, faster, sooner, at you know volume economics. Let's talk about the Open uh, Data Center Alliance. There's been some criticism, no, pub not public criticism, people are polite. There have been some kind of, you know, backroom conversations, well, you guys, the relevance of this, the market's changing, is it really relevant? I saw Marvin about this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, share with the folks why the Open uh, Data Center Alliance is relevant, yeah. and how you guys are handling the change, and why you guys are behind it. Yeah, so the Open Data Center Alliance, for the people that don't know, right, is a group of 300 end users, and so it's the customers who are deploying their own clouds, or they're using cloud-based services. And from my standpoint, that's hugely relevant because, uh, I, you know, there was a forecast, you know, people, people always have bigger forecasts, right? But there was a forecast that I saw earlier today that said that almost a quarter of a trillion dollars per year is going to be driven by cloud by 2020. I mean, that's a, a, an incredible amount of, of, of money to go capitalize on. And the reality is, is there's so many barriers to people actually moving into cloud still today, even after yeah. years of talking about this. So if you can get 300 companies they have a common vision that say, you know what, we want to be able to adapt to the cloud, but you've got to solve my top five problems and make those top five problems clear. Well, now I've got a target that I can go solve. And what's in it for Intel? I mean, what we do is we help to go create industries. I mean, that's what we've been doing. That's what we do the PC industry. Yep. Right? And that's what we're trying to go do here with cloud. And that's why we're behind the Open Data Center Alliance. Listen to the customer. Let them tell us what the problems are. Don't second guess them. Let's go solve their problems. And on the other hand, and enable right? the ecosystem. One thing Intel's done really well over the years, just uh, being close to the company, uh, is the when you get behind something, there's a lot of ecosystem around it that develops. Exactly. Now, can you talk about that in particular? From because you're in an interesting spot. You're not. Kind of, you're kind of in the front lines, but you're not in the front lines, but at the same time, you're enabling an ecosystem of service provider partners, people that work with directly with large enterprises. Yeah. What is the ecosystem like right now? What's the sentiment within the ecosystem? Yeah, so, so I mean, what, we're, what this whole event that we're at today is really about is bringing together the users of cloud and the service providers, that ecosystem, together to go solve the problems. And I think the, the ecosystem, you know, it's, it's it, it, uh, it's, there's, changing. There's, it's changing and there's also some conflict, right? On one hand, you have people wanting to deliver very proprietary vertical solutions. There's a benefit to that. It's fast, you've got one throat to choke, is good. The other hand is that there's the risk of lock-in or inflexibility and, and also customers get paralyzed. They're just not sure, like I gotta go make mm -hmm. a bet and that bet may be irrevocable for some period of time and the result is they sit on the sidelines. That's not what we want, right? We want customers to be able to feel like they've got choices, that these things will work together, that they're going to have some flexibility. They start to go use cloud services and the overall industry grows. And so what we're trying to do is, is find the right balance between how do you enable standards, which is good, it's like paving the road, and still allow enough flexibility that people can go different speeds, different directions, and that's really, I think, the challenge from a vendor perspective. You talked about creating industries. Let me get your take on big data. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously the storage group now is bolted on, uh, from what I heard within Intel, it may, may not be public, I don't know, but mm -hmm. you know, th that goes hand in glove, right? Yeah. Storage and servers. Um, big data seems to be, by our estimation, much more disruptive than, say, cloud is right now. Because cloud is more of an extension of infrastructure, as you said, resource pools. It, there's no real upside down market there. It doesn't yeah. really, at the same time, the big data market that talks about instrumenting, whether it's data, manufacturing data, military data, down to the consumer, retail, across the board data, and applications will change the, the business models of companies. Yeah. 
that's like the PC revolution, you know, putting productivity in the hands of the user. Big data is putting data in the hands of, you know, business people and analysts, not just geeks. Yeah. So we're seeing a massive rise up of kind of a new type of industry. Yeah. Um, how do you guys look at that? Because you have to enable that because it's part of your infrastructure <laughs> group. Data has to be yeah. dealt with yeah. in the cloud. You can't just spin down data. If it's a retail bursting situation, I can grab that data, I got to park it somewhere. It yep. creates more opportunity, essentially, yeah. but it's challenging. So what's your view there, and how do you see that unfolding? Yeah, so, so first of all, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think this is going to be far bigger than cloud, and I'll just give a couple of numbers. If you look at the entire IT market, it's about half a trillion dollars, and so if you took all the cost out of it, everything was free, that's your upside. That's the most, essentially, you're saving from cloud infrastructure, um, or infrastructure as a service, and the efficiencies of it. On the big data side, you're talking about revolutionizing problems that are trillions of dollars problems government, you know. Waste. Wait, you know, thank you, yeah. you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but you know, uh, government, government excess, right? But, but yeah. innovations, um, manufacturing data, new ways to go market and deliver products, healthcare, right? Huge yeah. opportunity Education. for big data. Education, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. So you look at all these things and you say it's trillions and trillions of dollars That's of every opportunity. every single vertical that people want to monetize. And I don't think, by the way, any of the forecasts that I've ever seen really do a good job of getting their arms wrapped around it because it's just so, so amazing. Okay. The thing that I am trying to go do, and back, kind of back to Intel, is again, we want to be able to create uh, an industry around big data. So this goes everything from how can we make more intelligent devices? So people talk about an internet of things or they talk about sensor data. We want to be able to have a better way of tapping into and having consistency across intelligent platforms, whether those are cars, smart mm -hmm. signs, embedded machines in manufacturing, video cameras, right? How can you make those devices more intelligent so that they become kind of that network? Yeah. And then the second is how do you, on the data center side, um, enable and foster the use of things such as a dupe or other types of frameworks that allow people to cost effectively tap into that information. And so if we provide those building blocks, and I think by the way, the other thing is there's a huge enabling effort here. You talk about ecosystems. We need more data scientists, right? We got to go do work with education. We have to do work in research. We have to kind of do for big data what Excel did for small data, right? We got to make it yeah. easy and accessible to use. If we can do those three things, we're talking about an industry that's going to have so much growth yeah. that, again, no one, it's no one's like, really It's like what you guys do. You, you guys abstract away the complexity and harden the tech so it's easy to use or turnkey. We if hope we so. can do that with uh, uh, the high-end roles, because right now, if you're a data scientist, you got to be a quant shock or a PhD to configure yeah. HBase, right? So yeah. <laughs> they, they, that's not the way it's supposed to be, right? Yeah. But I think that's ultimately an opportunity for the market. Um, so, so with that, let's talk about um, some of the innovations that are going to enable big data. What are your top three? Is it flash? Is it the storage? I mean, honestly, the compute, the the, the cores are key. So for you guys, mm -hmm. it's cores and and flash, right? What else do you have? Um, uh, uh, networking is huge. One of the big issues, when especially if you're running a MapReduce type of job, is you've got so many different servers that are connected together, and the latency to be able to go run a job effectively. The latency is important and bandwidth is important. And so we're seeing the need to be able to move to 10 gigabit as an example. That's one of the key technologies to accelerate that um, and do it cost effectively. Another thing that's really important is solid state storage, as you pointed out, having fast access to the data that is stored and caching tiers in that regard. And then the third is is delivering, you know, actually the software. Um, making sure that the software is tuned and optimized. Because again, this is another one of those problems. People what kind of software? So actually, cool. I'll, just, I'll just use I'll use Hadoop as an example. I was working with a company that is a world-class uh, e-commerce company, and we were looking at their Hadoop infrastructure, and at large scale, they were getting 4% efficiency out of that cluster. That is not good. Not it, good for in terms of In terms of the infrastructure, hardware? Yeah. In terms of the hardware, yeah. Processor and, 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 and everything else? You know, when you hear a problem like that, the first thing you got to go do is you got to look at the software and say, something could be tuned more effectively. And I don't think people know that Intel is a huge software group yeah. um, to go work on those types of applications, yeah. how, we, how we make them more efficient. And that's a great example. I mean, Hadoop is so early, it's nascent. Uh, it's great stuff. Final question for you, yeah. uh, Jason, is that in the future, what are you guys looking at that's, uh, that you see is important that may not be being discussed right now on, on the radar of mainstream and or industry journalists and, and analysts? What, what, what's uh, what are you watching to see that's really going to be an important piece that, that you just see the puzzle? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, that's a, good, that's a good question. You know, right now, big data, I know it's kind of now on the, the radar screen, but I, I think just the, the, here's the part that I think people aren't spending a lot of time on. I'll give you two, two things here. One is I think a lot of the focus on big data is web data. Um, 
a lot of the energy, the money is going into how do I go mine the information coming off of the web, how do I figure to use it to monetize advertisement placement, and that's certainly a great business model. I think we still need to take a lot of those smart data scientists and apply them to healthcare problems, manufacturing problems, logistics problems, retail problems. Um, that to me is, I think, an area yeah, real problems. It's 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 it's, it's, it's world under problems. It, well, world problems, and 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 the reality is, is just we're so I mean us included, we're so yeah. focused on the web. I think that's one. I think the other thing which I, I think um, there's a huge opportunity for is when you look at the number screens. Today everyone's so focused on the phone and maybe the tablets and they're focused on the PCs. But the reality is, is a lot of, of screens in the future are going to be cars, they're going to be smart signs, they're going to be TVs, they're going to be kiosks, they're going to be you know, uh, surveillance. Right? It, all these sort of uh, embedded applications. Um, we've been doing some work in some retail centers to go make some of these shopping experiences more interactive getting more developers to think about the fact that not only are they yeah. developing for a platform, but they're developing for this range of platforms, I think is another thing that hasn't really um, come to the forefront yeah, I yet. Think, I think the more developers can be educated that the distribution of their work can be pushed out to a different edge device, whereas retail will be very refreshing to them. I think most can't <laughs> get their arms around that. Yeah. Uh, okay, final question then, I guess final, final question is, uh, for your, what's your on your agenda this year at Intel? Looking ahead for the next year, what's your, uh, What's your agenda for the group? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll give you sort of you know two higher level uh, mm -hmm. objectives and then I'll talk about some of my, my personal ones. I, I want to be able to see that we have helped really move the agenda on standards-based cloud computing forward. I think the work that's being do done here through the Open Data Center Alliance is tremendous. I really want to make sure that we're starting to see that cycle come fu full circle. End users stating their requirements, solutions providers delivering to it, and the proof of concept to actually show that it all works together. That's one. And the second is is that uh, I, I want to see the, the market start to mature around big data, that there are solutions to go tap into that huge amount of data that people aren't tapping into uh, today. So. Big data is about real time, and you guys help provide with great cores and, and the embedded systems. Uh, Jason West with Intel. We'll be right back with our next guest here at Intel Forecast 2012. This is Cube Conversations. Thank you.